Adolf Coors Company, Golden, Colorado. The St. Louis Cardinals prepared for the 1980 season with wide-eyed enthusiasm. Men challenged machines to sharpen their skills. Hard workouts tested their strength, but whetted an appetite for excellence. It was a new attitude for a new era. 1980 marked the first season for head coach Jim Hannafin, a man whose personality infused the Cardinals with spirit and confidence. Good play out there! Oh yeah, big play, big play, Mark, up field now. Come on, Lou, you gotta have it, baby. Two for two D, that's great. Way to go. Uh, I'm ready now. 1980 is ours. With the cool of autumn approaching, these Cardinals were warming up. Executing with discipline and playing with desire, St. Louis developed the ability to corral the league's most talented teams. They were a team divided by young, raw talent and proven veteran experience. But as the season grew older, the Cardinals grew better. For the St. Louis Cardinals, it was a year of growth as they were turning the corner. to be a season of bright promise for the Cardinals. With a superb college draft, bolstering a record-breaking Cardinal offense, prosperity seemed just around the corner at Bush Stadium. But by the season's early weeks, a dark shadow loomed over St. Louis. Despite a brilliant opening day performance, 35 Cardinal points were insufficient to overcome the finest giant passing performance in 10 years. The following week produced an equally frustrating overtime defeat. Once lofty expectations were rudely jolted and Cardinal efforts to put it all together were just out of reach. Despair embraced the Cardinals during the first three weeks, when anticipated victories became heartbreaking defeats. With an upcoming game against the Eagles, everyone but Jim Hannafin had their doubts. We know this, that Philadelphia certainly will be gunned up and ready to play this, this Sunday afternoon. If we can knock them off, it really can show our team, our fellows, hey, how good they really are. Under Hannafin's guidance, a team splintered by disappointment had become united by pride. They prepared themselves for the year's toughest battle, and battle they did. Philadelphia never had a chance. On the Eagles' first possession, cornerback Carl Allen intercepted a Ron Jaworski pass and Allen made certain that nothing would stand between himself and six points. During the season's first 12 games, Philadelphia easily won 11 of them and were flying high in the NFL. But on this Sunday, the mighty Eagle would be grounded. Billy and... Gray to the left side. Now here is Hart giving off to Anderson on a reverse play at the 15, at the 10, at the 5. Touchdown, O.J. Anderson! The Eagles were wounded, and the final blow belonged to Otis Anderson. 
Here are the Cardinals on fourth and about a half yard at the Eagle 36. A gift to Anderson. Sweep to the right side. It's cut up. Dances inside the 35. He's going to go for the The Cardinals' first win proved to be the motivation to stir a potent poison for the opposition. Having recovered from their sagging ailments, St. Louis gained new punch and aggressiveness, fighting for every ball as if it were their last, and refusing to back down to anyone. This fight was never more evident than on the special teams, an authentic suicide trap for those whom crossed its path. The special teams became masters of the element of surprise, but their greatest moment came against the Lions, trailing 23 to 17 late in the fourth quarter. Here's the high snap. Skladeni takes it and kicks it high. Roy Green wants to return it, takes it on the 43, comes to the 45 midfield. Down to the 45, 40. He might score. He will score. The secondary. St. Louis's unaccommodating answer to a zealous passing game. Quarterbacks found it difficult to throw against St. Louis, especially against Carl Allen, number 27, who averaged 35 yards every time he intercepted the ball. Sometimes completions were not the measure of success, but whether or not a pass was ever thrown. Blitzing cornerbacks like Lee Nelson showed quarterbacks the finer comforts of the AstroTurf. Passers found it difficult to throw into such persistent tenacity, but their problems were compounded when their attention shifted to the Cardinal linebackers. Tim Carney, Mark Arneson, Steve Niels, Calvin Favron, and Eric Williams. Collectively, they form a cohesive unit that sticks opponents with jarring effectiveness. By the linebackers' standards, the Cardinals' 5-11 season was the year's most misleading statistic. They consistently kept St. Louis close, as six of the Cardinal losses were by an average of one touchdown. When the Cardinals look for defensive linemen, they look for a special type of player, a player who knows no fear and loves to hit. The 1980 draft successfully acquired this model player as St. Louis began building a front line to carry them through the 1980s. They found the inside strength of number 76 Stafford Mays and all-rookie selection Rush Brown, number 69. Both men out-wrestled most ball carriers. But number one draft choice, Curtis Greer, outran entire teams. Against the Baltimore Colts, Greer's outside rush was fierce as he racked up four sacks. While this game served as a tribute to Greer's growing skills, 
The collective efforts of the Cardinals were a testimony to game domination. The cold offensive line had seemed impenetrable by allowing just two sacks in the 28 previous quarters. But on this day, their efforts were swept away by a big red tie. By constantly denying Baltimore good field position, the Cardinal defense engineered a 17 to 10 victory. Subject to a 12 sack assault, the Baltimore passing game was brought to its knees. All shook up. An accurate description of how defenses felt when St. Louis revved up its versatile passing machine. With speedy receivers like number 80, Chris Combs, quarterback Jim Hart was able to throw the offense into full throttle at a moment's notice. When Hart wanted the consistency of more conservative passes, he sought out the power of rookie tight end Doug Marsh. As 235 pounds of acrobatic agility, many feel Marsh may develop into one of the league's premier tight ends. But as the NFL gradually gains respect for Marsh, teams stand in fear of the Cardinals' deep threat, Mel Gray. By the end of 1980, Gray had caught at least one pass for his 105th consecutive game, breaking a Cardinal record and establishing Gray as one of the most consistent receivers in football today. The success of Gray's 6,000-yard career has depended on two irrepressible talents, elusive moves and lightning quick speed. The combination has broken many games wide open. While Gray was the swift messenger, Pat Tilly proved to be the reckless daredevil. For what Tilly lacked in size and strength, he overcame with dexterity, desire, and great hands. Despite his 14th week injury, Tilly still finished an all-pro season with 68 receptions for 966 yards. He generated a certain magic every time he touched the ball. At times, Tilly made the impossible believable. While Tilly provided the electricity, the power was provided by the offensive line. Their duty was to keep Jim Hart untouched and unharmed, and none are more skilled than St. Louis's Rock of Gibraltar, perennial all-pro Dan Deardorff. The running game was equally solid as pulling linemen like number 60 Barney Cotton successfully leveled linebackers to provide wide glide paths to the end zone. The offensive line's ability to neutralize stubborn defenses allowed the Cards' running game to operate in high gear. One of St. Louis's most powerful runners is fullback Wayne Morris. And against New Orleans, Morris bowled over Saints like 10 pins. Morris finished the day with 100 yards, three touchdowns, and spearheaded a 40-7 win over their Superdome hosts. 
The Saints game was also a showcase for the generous running talents of number 33, Theotis Brown. Brown usually plays second fiddle in the Cardinal backfield, but on a day when the Cardinals gained 430 yards, Brown sat first chair. As the keystone to St. Louis's full house backfield, Brown and number 32 Otis Anderson also proved teammates that lived together blocked together as they provided Wayne Morris an unobstructed touchdown dive. Otis and Theotis were also a duo in the passing game as they transformed a simple square in into a play of lethal potential. Brown averaged four and a half yards every time he touched the ball. For a man of his skills, it must be trying to stand in another player's shadow. To stand in Otis Anderson's, it must be mind-boggling. In all of NFL history, only Earl Campbell has gained more yards than Otis Anderson in his two seasons. Like a true Superman, Anderson leaps over towering linemen in a single bound. And like a powerful locomotive, when Anderson picks up steam, there is no way to stop him. is the one trait that is shared by all the great runners. He maximizes the open holes and makes his own when they aren't there. In a year in which Anderson gained 1,352 yards, he rushed for 100 yards six times, 150 yards twice, and became the first runner ever to have three 100-yard games in a career against the vaunted Dallas Doomsday defense. Unless the NFL begins to use kryptonite, this man of steel may rewrite the entire record book. tradition. It is symbolic of 20 years of football in the River City. As the Cardinals honored their men of old in their first annual Old Timers reunion, they also saluted their man of gold, Jim Hart. In his 15-year career, Jim Hart has passed for more yards and more touchdowns than any other quarterback in football today. But for Hart, 1980 became a season of special meaning. Jim Hart became just the fifth quarterback ever to pass for 30,000 yards. Over the years, Hart has developed a fine sense of quarterback savvy. Detecting a linebacker's blitz, Hart calmly calls an audible foiling his stalker's best met intentions. Hart's level-headed discipline has assisted him in the most pressure-packed situations, where he has been a model of resourcefulness. Off the field, Hart has been the perfect leader. In 1980, he won the Brian Piccolo Award for the most community-minded athlete in professional sports. On the field, he has been a model of courage. In the season's 15th week, Hart bravely played with cracked ribs, unselfishly sacrificing himself and risking further injury. 
On this broken play to Mel Gray, Hart not only kept pace with the fleet-footed receiver, but made certain no Kansas City Chief came near him. And as he has done for 15 years, Hart outdistanced the deepest of coverages with one fatal strike. Pure talent of Hart and his teammates has made Coach Hannafin anxiously turn to the future. As he sees it, the Cardinals' invitation to postseason play is just a matter of attitude, effort, and consistency. One person's enthusiastic, and another one is going to be, and so on and so forth, and, and it's infectious. People often say, you know, how do you do this, or how do you do that, or how do you get things going? The only way I know about how to get things going is to really work hard, and if you work hard, I believe, Things will happen, good things will happen to you. At the same time, I know this, that success breeds success. A fellow that plays professional sports, the one thing that sets him apart from everybody else is the fact that he's got great pride. He's got great pride in thinking about next season. And what I want to establish is a winning attitude around here, get things going where guys say, hey, by gum, if we really get off the dime, we can do it. For the Cardinals, the future is to develop Hannafin's winning formula, a formula which began to boil in 1980. First down at the Dallas 42. And on first down, Hart back to throw. Steps up and airs it long for Tilly. Tilly got it! Touchdown! He jumped up and took it over the defensive man. Steve Wilson has got it for a touchdown on a spectacular play. 